Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 325 for Monday, November 8th, 2021. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to, or welcome back, to Gig Gab, the show by four and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire on this lovely Monday. I'm Dave Hamilton. This is Paul Kent in Napomo, California. I'm tired again today, man. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I don't, I don't know. It, like the time change shouldn't make me tired, but, but it certainly started yesterday morning. But then I had a long uh, fling rehearsal yesterday, and then I had another one of those, uh, the third, uh, well, of what is currently four, but the third of the uh, what's going on performances last night. So, but that doesn't go late, you know, so I have no excuse, but, um, but I'm tired again. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You just, you kind of get into these, these, uh, streaks where you kind of burn the candle. I mean, I, I had four gigs in the last four days and, you know, sometimes that's not a big deal, but sometimes if it's a, yeah. a night gig followed by a day gig that starts you in the, in, you know, being tired yep. and then the next gig, you know, you, you just don't recover for a couple of days. And especially, you know, Lord knows as you get a little older, the schlepping of gear and the later nights and that type of stuff. But oh, I don't know anything about that, Paul. No, no, mm. no. <laughs> funny. Yeah, you're a funny I, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I slept a, uh, a, a B3 and a. And a Leslie yesterday with, with assistance, but you know, Ooh. yeah, you know, that's, it's rare that I get to say, man, now I know why I became a drummer, you know, but, but moving those things, that's exactly why, especially that B3, that is just dead weight, man. Yeah. Gosh. It's just, and that used to be a, that, that it's a rare thing when you move those things now, but yeah. many bands used to carry those things, you know, among, among Marshall stacks and, yeah. and many, uh, like, I'm sure your drum kit was way bigger once upon a day, right? Way bigger and way heavier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we have gotten things. It's funny. The, the drummer for this, um, this what's going on gig is, is this guy, John met who has become the cocktail drum kit guy. And he, like, of everyone at the gig, he brought the smallest car, and yet he fit his entire drum set in it. He has, uh, he was actually using one of these Mapex Saturn uh, cocktail kits, and it sounded great because it's walnut drums, and walnut tends to bring the fundamental uh, down like a whole drum size, essentially. So, if, you know, if you get a 12 inch drum, it sounds like a 13 or a 14. Even if you get a 14, it sounds like a 16. And so mm. it like it, his drum sounded fantastic in the room. Um, but yeah, he's got all these different cocktail kits that he kind of puts together, but he has this tiny little car. It's, it's crazy seeing him. Show. Car. Yeah, it kind of is. And he just pulls all his drums out of it. It's, it's great. But, um, but the gig went well, this was an interesting one because, We've did, now that we've done three, the um, the show is obviously it's the album. What's going on? But it it's it's there are pieces to the show uh, as the songs sort of link together. Where Stu is playing some samples of uh, speeches and things, some speeches that happened back then, fifty years ago when the record came out, and some that happen now to sort of tie it all together and show how the messages in, in this record are still very, very relevant and, and uh, important for society today. So we've done three of these gigs. The, the first one we did was at the press room and that was kind of a balance between the party vibe and the social vibe, right? Um, the, the social message vibe, I should say parties are very right. social things. And then the second one we did was on uh, the night before Halloween. And that was at Marty's barn. And that was very, very much more leaning towards the party vibe, which was great, you know, and last night was at green acre Baha'i center here in uh, actually right over the, the right over the bridge in Elliott, Maine. And, uh, and that was very much more the social vibe. I mean, it, it still had that party element uh, in the performance, but people were seated there's no alcohol being saw, uh, served as you might expect at a, you know, a Baha'i center. And, uh, and, it, and, and then there, there was even a, a Stu did a short interview afterwards uh, where the host of the event, but also the crowd, you know, had some questions for him about, you know, how he put together the thing and all that stuff. And we, actually we have a question about that later in the show that we'll talk about too. But, um, 
but yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was, I was concerned with how it would be received in a vibe like last night, you know, cause, cause it, it is, you know, we're performing movie, music. Yes. There are some messages in the music, but it's still this joyous thing. Even at the end of the record, it, you know, it sort of ends on this high note and uh, I mean a high note emotionally, but also a high note uh, that Marvin Gaye sings. And so um, I was concerned about, you know, is it going to be received in a, in a positive way if we go out there and play this and clearly are enjoying playing this. And it was, it was, it was my, my concerns were unfounded. It was fantastic. People loved it. So it was good. It was fun. You know, something to do. Yeah. yeah. Another Sunday gig. It's how it goes. That's it. <laughs> I think that's it though. I, I don't know that I have any other gigs on the calendar this year. I think that's kind of the end of wow. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, COVID and, and all that just kind of, uh, may, none of the bands I play in regularly are booking indoor shows. I'm just looking at my calendar here, but yeah, I don't think I have. Anything. And so, um, your, your, uh, party band, um, I definitely, we've seen it as well. We have one holiday show, one mm. uh, corporate holiday show. And so your your uh, what, what's your holiday band called again? The Uptown Celebration. Yeah. Yeah. So that band has been on a, d a de facto hiatus basically since COVID started. And, and Gary has other businesses that he, he does. He, he actually started a restaurant right when I joined the band, he started a restaurant. He has since sold that, but from the restaurant, he evolved into running a couple of food trucks, which are doing really well for him. And so that has really been taking up a lot of his time as he's developed that business. However, now he's sort of got that in a place where things are uh, stable and he reached out to everybody and was like, all right, I'm ready to, you know, start putting this back together again. Let's look at the song list. Let's look at this. So he's, he's ready to go. Uh, yeah. But, but that, that's only in the last week. Like, so it, th the reason that we have no holiday gigs is not it, it, whether or not COVID would have had an impact. And I'm sure it would have. Uh, the reason we have no holiday gigs is because Gary has not been actively booking any uh, and probably has been turning things down would be my guess throughout this. Mm. Yeah. Well, he just, I mean, you know, it was, he kind of made it clear to us. He's like, yeah, if, if somebody else doesn't want to do the bookings, why, well, I, you know, I, I'm not going to be doing the bookings anymore. And, uh, and we talked about it. It was like, you know, oh, Gary, wait a second. I yeah. thought I didn't even know it was an option that somebody else would do the booking. I thought it was his band. He did it. He did the counting. He did all this type of stuff. Yep. What, how did he, how did he, did he like, if somebody else wants to do it, I'll show up and play, Correct. but I'm not going to, that's what he said. That's what he said. It's like almost exactly and, what he said. It's like, you're reading my texts. That's right. And yeah. did he, and did he say, here's, here's what you can keep as a, as a finder's fee for any gig you find? Oh, of course. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. And that's always been clear. Uh, even when he takes a finder's fee for a gig, like the hundred percent of that is on the spreadsheet that we get at every gig. So, yeah. So he was like, somebody else wants the finder's fee. Like, here it is. It's, it's yours for the taking. And uh, one of the other members of the band w was toying with the idea of doing it, but you know, the reality is Gary is a master at this and he really, but that, that's actually the thing. Yeah. And, and it, cause I, you know, I've, I've offered that in my band as well, but it's, it's not, it's not the way it works. You know, like, mm -hmm. like again, when you think about leaders and, you know, people doing certain things in a band, having certain roles, you know, uh, the, the somewhat, and I'm not saying naive would be too strong a word, but sure. I mean, if the band isn't in a mode where everybody is constantly thinking about it, the likeliness that one guy's going to say, Oh, I'll step up and take on this role now when no one has done that in the past is just, it doesn't seem to work that way. You know what I mean? It doesn't work that way. No, right. it, no. I, and I've seen it before. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, okay, well, I, and I, you know, knowing the personalities in the band, it's like it, it, I know that it won't be me, but I'm the only one that has any like business slash sales experience yeah. in this. So I, I'm like, well, if it's not going to be me and it's not, then it's not going to be anybody. I, you know, and I was sort of surprised when one of the other members said, Oh, I was like, okay, great. And I kind of know, you know, Gary's a, uh, I mean, I love him dearly. And, and I would, I, I think I have told him this. So if he's listening, you know, this is fine. It's not, we're, I'm not talking out of school here, but he's a, you know, he's a type a control freak kind of person, something I recognize, uh, and respect, uh, <laughs> <In the mirror. laughs> yeah, looking in the mirror. Yeah, exactly. And, and I knew that if somebody else started doing it, he couldn't 
keep out of it. Like, I, and, and again, I'm projecting. I I don't know him all that well. Uh, you know, I only know him in the con, confines of the band. So I could be wrong about that assumption. But my assumption was that if someone else had started doing it, he would have micromanaged it so much that he would have just wound up doing it. And so for that reason, I did consider it. I was like, well, you know, I, I know that it's not really going to be me. And so maybe it's worth it. And then it, I decided it was not, you know, and uh, but I, I, I kind of had hoped that that if somebody else really just took the reins just for a short period of time, it would immediately revert back to Gary. And, um, and here we are. So, you know, it didn't, I don't know that it, I don't know that anything would be different because yeah. he's, you know, he's kind of taking it over uh, again now or, or rekindling it, I should say. So I'm curious to see where that goes. I'm curious to see how frequently he winds up wanting to play and how that fits in with, everything else that not only I'm doing, but everything else, everybody else that plays in the band is doing. And, you know, it's, it like, it's not just COVID it's been, you know, COVID plus that, that he has not been booking gigs. So I'm, I'm just curious to see how it, you know, how it all shakes out and if it yeah. shakes out, but I mean, I, I, you know, I always enjoyed those gigs. I enjoyed hanging out with the band. The gigs are weird. Like they're wedding gigs. So it's like, you know, you enjoy them as much as you can, you know what I mean? They're not, it's not about us. So it's just, you're going out and playing. And so it's, and, well, they're money gigs. They're, they're money they're gigs. That's financial. It. Cur- and it's that, a financial instrument. Because for a lot of, for a lot of people, that's why they're, why they're playing music. It's, yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I'm fascinated by this concept of, to me, I always ran the band out of a sense of panic that if I didn't keep us booked, the guys will get busy with other things and it'll be almost impossible. And I personally find it extremely, um, like subs on gigs have to happen sometimes in the, in the interest of the greater good. So you can get like in my band, will I sub a guy so nine other guys can get a good payday, right? You know, that type of thing. Sure. But you know, it just, you're always in the back of your mind wondering what the guy doesn't know, you know, what he's going to guess at. Like we've had guys. All sorts of weird things when you have subs, right? It's always gr- weird. Yeah, it's always weird, and 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 it's uncomfortable to me. But the uh, well, that's what it is. You 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 when you've got a sub, you you really aren't taking the stage with the same comfort level that you would without you, you know if it's right. just a normal band, and that's everybody, the sub and every member of the band. Now there's different levels of discomfort of course depending on the scenario yeah. and the people. Well but. there's regular subs also. There's people who have subbed with you enough that they're kind of a, you know, a yeah. ghosted extension of your band. They're, yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it's like, "Oh, we've got that guy. Oh, okay, that's no big deal." Y- you know. But my like, point to this yeah. relative to what you're talking about with Uptown is is um you know, uh musicians want to play and they will get They'll start taking invites and start doing other things. And the energy of the core band, this is why bands are weird. Like some people, there's a, there's a musician mindset that I'm a gun for hire. I happen to be for hired mostly by this one place that I choose to give my talents to it is a mindset. And then there's the band mindset where we're all in this together. We're all working towards a common goal. Right. That one, one really great thing is better than a bunch of, of okay things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, for Uptown, if you're kind of going into that limbo area, the people in Uptown are good enough to play with other people and, and they will. And so something comes along and now you got to check everybody's availability because the assumption is not that they're always available because you kind of cut them loose. Right. And, uh, you know, then you can't take a gig because X amount of people are or are not available. And then it's further you know, the one guy who says, yeah, I'm available. And then the gig doesn't happen. Then that guy gets, gets kind of frustrated and disappointed. So yep. I always thought momentum and constancy were one of the biggest ways to get a band off the ground and going forward. And well, so that's, that's, that's the key is just, you know, keep the bookings happening or keep the activity happening, whatever that activity for that particular band is. And it might be, you know, recording at times or whatever, but right. just keeping things, people, keeping people engaged. Absolutely. Yeah. Up, Uptown was never a band, at least n- none of the time I was, I've been playing in it. It's never been a band of assumed availability for any of the members. But it is a band of 
you know, Gary sends out a text, are we available on this date? And, and the expectation is that, you know, you get back within, you know, hours or less kind of thing, mm -hmm. which, it, which works out fine. Now it has to be the right band and the right, sorry, the right people to make a band work that way, that that's a, that's a dangerous way to do it. Unless you've got people that are really on the ball uh, in terms of, of responsiveness and uh, because otherwise, you know, you wind up losing gigs if you can't commit yeah. to them. Yeah. Yeah. But with the party scene, it, it, the, the, my interpretation of it, and I'm, I'm certain I'm wrong, but my interpretation of it, at least here is, you know, the corporate party or the wedding scene, you have a little bit more time than you do when the booking agent for a club decides this afternoon is the afternoon I'm going to book the summer for that club. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like a Paul Costley kind of guy, right. We had Paul on the show here. He and, and uh, his, his team there book. It's, it's probably got to be close to a hundred clubs in, you know, in this area. It certainly mm -hmm. seems like that. So there is the day that, you know, he's booking the gaslight deck for the summer and so, uh, you know, he's got his calendar out and he starts going around and he's texting and calling all the people that he wants to make sure he slots in. And if you don't have an answer for him the moment that he calls you, you don't get the gig, right? The, right. Yeah, he goes on to the next one. And you might be able to get some fill-in slots later down the road, you know, but but that's a very different thing than the, you know, we have a, a proposal and, and the, you know, the booking comes back and forth with the the party thing. It seems like there's a whole lot more to it. And, and therefore there's a little bit of extra time baked into the schedule such that, you know, even if it does take somebody, you know, you know, he sends, if Gary sends out the text at seven in the morning or whatever, and you know, somebody doesn't get back until seven that night, it's usually not a disaster. You know, like that we have that kind of time with, yeah. with that, with the type of bookings that that band does. So, yeah. Yeah. It's craziness though. It's, um, I'm curious to see where that goes. I, it, like I said, it'll be, it'll be interesting. So mm -hmm. we did get a question in my friend from Eric who said, uh, I'd love to hear more about the show featuring one album. How many rehearsals are involved? How does uh, the leader pick the albums, the band? How it sounds like a really fun idea. So, you know, I've only done one of these with Stu, uh, but I've, I've been, I've had enough conversations with him about it that I, I kind of have an idea as to this it, in terms of picking the, uh, the record, I'll answer kind of in reverse order here, but in terms of picking the record, uh, he picks something that a means something to him and B that he has a vision about how he can, present he he wants right. to make it a show so you know this marvin gay record it's it's the it's been out 50 years it's also and this is a weird thing especially getting to know this album because it's a really bizarre album it's not really it's not a collection of songs it is this one sort of song cycle uh it's really more just a loose jam that kind of has lyrics peppered in and uh, occasionally some hits uh, came out of it but it is Motown Records' number one bestseller still to this day, wow. yeah, which is weird. I, like it, it especially like I said, go and listen to what's going on start to finish, and then put it in, it, frame it in that context. It, it's just bizarre. It's Inner Visions, Stevie is number two. So I, I don't know. It's just <laughs> it kind of blows me away. But that's part of it, right? Like all of these things, and that it was a record that has messages that are, that are applicable to today's world uh, as much as they were applicable to, you know, the world five decades ago. Well, so that message is part of it. I think, I think yeah. also, um, you know, there's a few different variables. One, how well known are you? Is it, is it that people are excited to hear you channel something or is it just a very marketable thing? Like I always thought we're going to do a summer kickoff show next year, right? So this venue that we have a deal with where we do t a ticketed show, um, you know, I have to find reasons to do it because they also do free music for a stretch sure. during the, right? So I was thinking, you know, what would be would cool? Well, gee, wouldn't a Jimmy Buffett summer kickoff show make sense on just on the surface to people? Sure. It would catch people. I, again, you know whether you're selling to a fan base of 5, 10, 15, 20, or whether you need to, you know, expand that net wider. And then you kind of get into kind of marketing, you know, yeah. concepts, like what will catch people's eye? What will go, oh, yes, I get it. That sounds like fun. So I, I think that's part of it. But if you're well-known in your market, 
and uh, people trust that you will give them a good night of entertainment, I think that you can probably sell something that uh, that you can say this is really meaningful to me. We'll, I have we'll experience. See. What, uh, Stu, because he Stu did um, uh, the band music from Big Pink first, and that one sold very well. This one sold very well. This is number two. Number three is Kid A uh, from Radiohead. So uh, you know that's a well known record that will sell very well. The one he's doing in December, I don't know if he's named it yet, but it doesn't matter. I can't remember the name of the record or the name of the band. Uh, but it is a, it is a fantastic funk album, but no one, it's not going to sell based upon the recognizable factor of the album itself. It, no but, one's going to know. Stu's done enough of these that now there's a reputation for Stu's album tribute parties. That's right? the hope that, like that's, yeah. but that's the thing is like it, w w the, the proof will be in that pudding, right? Th does it work or does it not? I'm not part of that one, but, but I'm, I'm very curious to see, you know, how it, how it goes because, because of exactly that. And then, um, the next, what's the next thing? How does he pick the band? Once he knows what record he's doing, he, uh, he starts thinking about, you know, what, how to put it together. This particular record, I think there, you know, it's probably 30 musicians playing on it because it's the Funk Brothers and there's a string section and all yeah. of that stuff. He knew he wasn't going to put 30 people on stage. So he decided to have a rhythm section, you know, guitar, bass, drums. And then he knew he needed percussion. So, okay, great percussion. Cause it's, it's all over that record. You can't do it without it. He didn't want to do it without it. And then to replace the strings, he chose to move to keyboards, right? So he had the Rhodes player and the B3 player and, uh, and then the Rhodes player also plays saxophone. So great. We had that. And, and that was enough to interpret this record in a way that, that was, you know, workable. It's very different to do this with keys instead of keys sort of leading the, the textural charge as opposed to strings leading the textural charge, especially at certain points during the record. But so that's how he picks his musicians, but he also has a stable of musicians. So it's probably, it's probably happening in parallel, right? Like he's thinking about the record. He's thinking about how he could do it with the people that he knows he would likely have be able to play on this, right? Like, you, you know, you, you put all these things together at once and then rehearsal wise, you know, it's, it was interesting because we all listened to the record coming into the first rehearsal. And I think that probably confused us more because, because of how weird this album is. Like, I don't know I, I would be curious to see how different the process was for like songs from Big Pink or for Kid A versus uh, this record because we showed up at the first rehearsal and we we're like, "What exactly is the idea here? Like, how's this going to work?" And um, and and then and that's when Stu sort of explained his vision. He's like, "Okay, we're going to play this. We're, you know, we're only going to stop once. Uh, otherwise, every song is going to segue into each other." Here's my idea for how to do this. But he left a lot of freedom up to everybody to sort of interpret with him making it clear that, you know, if there was any confusion or whatever, he would be the final arbiter of, of how that all came together, which makes sense. Like, you got to have somebody that's in charge. Right. But otherwise, it was he just sort of explained his vision and he was like, just go with it, you know, and and here's here's how I see this record let's interpret it with that in mind and yeah. you know, and here we go, but the rehearsals. So we did three rehearsals. We would have liked to have, four, have had four, but I think that's probably always true. Uh, you always want one more, maybe uh, unless you do way too many, but you know, we played the first half of the album at the first rehearsal, but you know, again, it's a 38 minute record and we rehearsed for a couple hours each time. So it, there were lots of things to talk through transitions yeah. How, how we were going to, these aren't just pop songs, right? Where it's like, okay, it's super simple to understand the structure. These songs are weird. Cause they're, like I said, they're, they're jams over which lyrics were put. So it, we had to balance this, uh, between just it being a loose jam with familiar lyrics versus let's recreate the chord structure of that jam. And so there was a lot of discussion about, okay, well, 
yeah, that that's got a this interesting progression, but it doesn't really matter or that's got an interesting pr- progression and it does really matter. So there were a lot of conversations about where to apply what happened on the record more faithfully or less faithfully in order to to turn out this product. And I think it worked out, but it was a, it was an interesting process. The rehearsal process was I would say more of an arranging process than a let's learn things here process, right? right? You know, which which honestly is how rehearsals should be, in my opinion. Uh, you know, uh, it is. I don't want to say all rehearsals should be that way, but it, that is a productive way to have rehearsals where everybody comes in knowing what they need to know for themselves, and then yeah. making sure everybody's on the same page, so that you know when we go and play it, it doesn't look like we're you know, just guessing, which sometimes. We so, do anyway. so let me back you up here. So I, there's a few things. So there are people who organize these types of things who are like, no, this needs to be a note for note recreation to do it right. It's kind of like that argument about what, whether something's a tribute band or sure. whether something is just sure. a cover band. Right. Yep. And, um, you know, you're going to have a bunch of people with different opinions about that. But I think what happens is choose that will, that will divine what you who you choose to be part of the bands that, that do these things together. Right. So, you know, like, um, I haven't done an album tribute, but I've done several and been a part of several artist tributes. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Some, similar some kind were of thing. Like, yeah. yeah. Similar kind of thing. So, and some of the, so the ones that I've done, I was like, well, I did, I've done Springsteen and I've done Petty. And what I would do is I would, and again, I have a little bit of a following where I am. So I knew that people, uh, there would be a mix of people who were like, oh, you know, Paul's going to play Springsteen music. You know, that, that'll be interesting. What I would do is I would say, here are the non-negotiable parts of some songs. Not all, not every note of every song, but because I knew that, you know, several of the musicians wouldn't be as familiar. And I knew it was a limited amount of time that I would have their attention for it. Yep. And I knew this was a one-off. So, you know, I was being somewhat realistic that that how much time and effort would go into polishing the apple, so to speak, was probably finite. And so what I kind of organized my life was like, all right, four or five rehearsals. I've got, you know, 20, 25 songs I got to cover. Um, I would send out the list. I would be clear about the expectations about what would happen in each rehearsal. One other guy I know who's done this, he actually did a listening party, a table read, he called it, and, you know, sat down with the musicians and they all listened to the stuff together, and he pointed out this this is really important in the song, that type of thing, right? So I, what I'm addressing here is, do you do it note, note for note versus do you do the spirit of it? Some, some of it has to do with the person who's going to be interpreting the music, who's in front of it and leading the project, and some of it has to do with the reality of what you'll be able to get from the musicians who'll be able to participate. I erred on the side of caution assuming I'm not going to get a hundred percent, someone's going to dive into it as deep as I would like to. So what, what can I, what can I realistically do? So, you know, we did a Springsteen, which is like really some heavily involved keyboard parts. I sat with the keyboard player alone, just the two of us on a few occasions and said, this section of jungle land is really important. Everybody who knows Springsteen will know this. You sure. got to get this part, right. And we, I did that pretty much the whole show. I would say that, you know, in regards to the rehearsals, again, Four or five rehearsals is probably likely, but what a good leader does is he probably does some sectional rehearsals. If your if your show is vocal intensive, just sure. do a couple with the vocalists. You know, whole band run throughs was only probably one or two, maybe three of those. But you know, breaking it up into smaller parts where the guy organizing the project is kind of spot checking and working with this horn section or working with a rhythm section or you know whatever it may be. So you know, you got to kind of block out your plan and your time because again probably a one-off if you can get a couple in a weekend, but then if you could do a couple in a weekend, are you kind of diluting ticket sales in any one place? So you got to kind of think about that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think you got to be realistic about a couple of, of moving targets yeah. on how to get these things done. And that, and that's kind of why we only had three rehearsals for, you know, for this particular one it was exactly that. Stu was very respectful of everyone's time but he also knew everyone's talents. And so he knew, okay, I don't need to worry about, you know, these four things with that guy and these five things with this guy. And, you know, it was like, okay, let's get together. Let's talk through the things that need to be talked through. I think if there were, 
it would have been a good thing for even just Stu and I to sit down and sing through some of these things because really we never had a vocal rehearsal. We've, we've, we just sort of pulled it together and it's been fine. It's just the two of us singing. So it, it's not like we need to, to figure out harmonies. In fact, there's some, I, I was telling sky, my daughter, you know, as we come, as we were coming into last night's gig and I, I played them the record on the way home, we went and saw fastball on, on Saturday night and I played them. The saw record. that. Yeah. It was fantastic. Uh, they, you know, they played acoustic and it was really nice to be able to hear all the harmonies and, and everything they, they did a, they really, it was awesome. It was great. The fix, they opened for the fix. We went to see fastball. So church rules did not apply. We didn't have to stay until <laughs> li lights up for the fix. Cause we stayed till lights up after fastball and we made it three or four songs for the fix. And then, um, and then kind of all looked at each other, like, this is not really all that good. And so we left, yeah. which was fine. You know, it, it was all good. But um, on the way back, I, you know, I played them the records because they were coming last night. Uh, they came last night. And so I'm like, you should know this record, even though it doesn't really matter. It's only 38 minutes. We have a, you know, 65 drive. Minute drive home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. And, uh, and, and there were a couple moments where I said to Sky, I'm like, oh, you, you and I get to find out together tomorrow night, whether I'm singing, you know, the high part here or the low part here. And she's like, oh, does Stu make it up as he goes? I'm like, oh, absolutely. So, you know, it, it, like those kinds of things, but it's, when it's just two people, as long as you trust each other and you understand, like, if if Stu starts high somewhere, don't change. Like, stay where you are. That tells me where you're going to remain. I will come in underneath you. It's going to be fine. It, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, and it worked out. You know, it worked out fine. So, mm -hmm. um, although we did skip a song last night, which was bizarre. Uh, we skipped God is Love. We were kind On of in purpose? this. No. We had no idea. Um, uh, we're, you know, we're playing kind of the groove of the song before that at the end of it. And we see Stu turning to Nick, our, our keyboard slash sax player, you know, like, okay, it's time to play your cue line. It's like, no, it's not like what, you know, we were all sort of confused. And then he just started, he went up to the mic and started singing mercy, mercy me. And uh, I was like, oh, better sing harmonies. And hopefully the band will move up a half step so that we're actually all in the same key, which they did. Everybody really adapted fast, which is, you know, huge to have big ears. And then, you know, we, so we finished the the show. Cause like I said, it doesn't really stop. And we got to the end and immediately Stu sort of jumped into this Q and a while we were moving some gear off stage, we waited to move some of the bigger stuff. And, uh, as we were moving the bigger stuff after the Q and a, I'm like, Oh, so that was the abridged version. He, and he sort of laughed like, oh, yeah. I'm like, no, well, like we skipped God is love. And he looked and he was like, Oh, I had no idea. He's like, Wow. I'm like, oh, I kind of figured you knew. He's like, not until just now. <laughs> He's like, I'm really glad I didn't know while I was doing the Q&A. Has <laughs> that ever happened to you in a gig where, where you stare at your set list to get the next song? Oh, all the time. You stare. You stare at the set list. Yep. And then you still skip a song. You skip to the right to the next song. Absolutely. And I think part of it, because I've, I, it's happened more than once to me. It doesn't happen all the time. But I think part of it is... You know, if I look too early, like if we're in the second chorus or finishing the second chorus of a tune or whatever, and I look down and I'm like, what's next? Oh, I see what's next. Okay, cool. Now that song is kind of in the past for me, right? And so I look again and it's like, what's next? And I'm skipping over the one that that we haven't played, but I've already put in the back of my head is like, yeah, I, you, I, get, I should, I, I need to only allow myself to do it once, to look at the set list once per song and then everything will be fine. I think, mm. I don't know, but yes, it I, happens all the time with the band. Like, yeah. Hey, what? You know, I, I saw it know. happen to rush live. <laughs> uh, was How on, did you know? Um, because, <laughs> because, uh, I, I don't think, I think it might've been our first time seeing them that tour. They, back then they were playing exactly the same set list every night. So, and, and that basically remained through their career. They, they had, uh, they got to a point where they would have like three different set lists that they would sort of rotate between, but it would only be three or four songs different per night. Uh, but anyway, it was this one gig where um, Getty, it was on the, I think it was on the hold your fire tour. Getty started introducing the next song and, and he says, what, what, wait, what's that? And he looked back and it was obvious Neil Peart was telling him something and he's like, ah, right. Not that song yet. <laughs> That's so, funny. Yeah, it happens, right? I mean, like, you know, especially if you're doing a thing like this where it's, you know, you just start playing the same set list, whether it's for playing one album like we did last night or if it's just a show that you've put together. 
And, and if there's nothing to link things together, which of course there was last night, but we didn't do it anyway. Um, I, it's easy to be like, Oh yeah, we did that. Oh no, we didn't do that. Not tonight. We did it yesterday. <laughs> it happens. It happens. For sure. But it, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's the part I love about live music. I mean, I, I, am sad we didn't get to play God is love last night. Cause it's a, it's a great tune with some great melodies and it's, it's like the hit from that record that never be, became a hit. But it's it's a nice little surprise in the in the middle of it where it's not a song, you know, most of the time for most folks. But it's uh, but it's a song that has like a hooky little, you know, little melody and, and stuff. Yeah. So, it you know, it's a nice little moment in there. And um, I was sad that we didn't get to get to play it. But, you know, whatever. I mean, that's how it goes. That's how gigs are. That's I what I tell love. you. I, that, that, that is absolutely that in the moment on the fly. Adaptation, everybody, you know, as I, as I like to say, you know, right is a consensus, not an argument. And, uh, last night, the, uh, the, the rule was, I mean, it was Stu's the leader of the band. So it's always follow him, right. No matter what, but there is that, that sort of unwritten rule of the guy who doesn't know that he is wrong therefore might have to be the one that everybody agrees is right. <laughs> yeah, right. Like if you don't know that you're screwing something up, especially if you're the, the singer or whatever, it's like, well, it doesn't matter. He's right now, you know, and we'll talk to well, him later about it. But for now we're all going with that person, you know? Yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ascribe right to it, but I would say he's driving the bus or, you know, like yeah. he, he gets to win right now, but yes. uh, we'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. But, but it's like, yeah, in the moment. Yeah. Like, like I said, right is a consensus. There's, there's no, it's not an argument. No one wins that particular argument. Uh, if yeah. you try to have it in the moment. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. Yeah. You know, I had a gig on, uh, on Friday night and it was one of my coffee house gigs that I've been doing mostly solo since we've come out of COVID, since it, the place opened up again. I had one gig that I did with a with our friend Chris Breen on, on oh, Keys, nice. but he's he's decided to back out of them. So, um, uh, but he may be coming back. But anyway, I, you know, I, I wanted to have a little more energy, so I invited a drummer and I invited a bass player and a fr another friend of mine who's a violin player who sat in and we did a couple special songs of his. And... Um, it was an interesting situation because, again, no rehearsal, but I know these guys can play. Sent the song list, all the keys, mostly, not completely, clarified the versions of the songs we're doing. We had to have a little huddle before we started to... It, it, the funny one, the one that would have gone off the rails if we didn't have the conversation was one after nine on nine. <laughs> right? That's a pretty you, straightforward why, right? tune. I do know well, why. Yeah, because it's not straightforward. Two versions of it. Yes, yeah, right. Well, it's two, right? So we didn't oh, do the... Yeah. We, yeah, yeah, we did the anthology version. So um, The Smithereens uh, so that version. Was, that, that, there you go. I mean, the Smithereens sort of... To me, they took that anthology version and and cemented it in like the way that a rock band can can play it today, it, right? Because there's uh, for those that don't know, one after nine oh nine, there's the there's the shuffly version and then there's the straight ahead version. Yeah, and if you have disagreement or uh, missed expectations about that, I can see where that might be a bit of a disaster. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so the guy showed up, and again, it was. It's an interesting thing because, you know, when you play with the good players and, you know, you do it this way, they do show up and they're, and they are largely prepared. Are they, is everything completely perfect? No. Of the things that aren't perfect, how much can the audience tell? Maybe 20% or 25%. So, so you're taking, you know, if out of 10 songs, eight of them are, you know, and, you, and again, you're not picking Zappa tunes, you're picking, you know, fairly yeah. songs that are predictably okay to get through, right? Yes. Um, you know, eight of them you get through, two of them are a little shaky, uh, and 20% of of one of the two, you know, is train wrecky, and you make some, you know, funny comment about it, and, you know, you're you're off to the races. That's so, it, yeah. So it's just kind of an interesting thing, and it's, and it's a nice way to do it. You know, good musicians obviously can. And it got me thinking, like, what do we do at rehearsals, right? You know, and I was thinking that if, if your rehearsal – is a a vehicle to spot check everybody's work ethic. You see where I'm going with that? Like, like everybody knows you're supposed to come to rehearsal prepared. Even if your band, even if your band has eased into the process of, well, I know the other 
guy or two guys are not going to be as prepared. So I only have to be 70% prepared yeah, yeah, and I'm, yeah, yeah. and I'm compliant enough to not be that guy in the rehearsal. And is your, is that what most bands rehearsals are? They're like, all right, two, well, two they out of five. They shouldn't be that, that, that seems like a, a bad, I, I, I mean, I've been involved in this, right? Like it, it, I know exactly what you're talking about, but I tried really hard to avoid playing in those kinds of scenarios because it's right. like, that's total amateur hour. As far as I'm concerned, if, if you're showing up and setting your level of preparation relative to what you think others have done so that you're not the worst, like, what? Right. like that, like, that, like, I don't even think I need to finish this thought. Like if you just take, if you shine a light on that, it's like, this is wrong. But when we were talking to David Jameson, you know, uh, Tribute band extraordinaire, right? Mem tribute band member extraordinaire, uh -huh. I should say. He he talked about that. He was like, oh, once I joined, I think the first one was the security project, right? The Peter Gabriel thing. It's like, once I played with that and realized that rehearsal wasn't just to do exactly what you described, you know, it was to, to now work on the arrangements of the tunes because the assumption is everybody knows the songs well enough to just play them through. Like if we're just going to play them the way they are on the record, then, then there's no reason to have a rehearsal. Uh, you, you know, then I, that's a wonderful thing. And I agree with him and it, it, it doesn't take much to, to set that as the bar. I don't think I, but again, I mean, I I've been in that scenario. I'm sure I'll find myself in that scenario again, but I don't like it. Uh, well, I think bands ease into that type of thing, yeah. right? If, if, if rehearsal is a hangout and drink and get stoned type of thing, and let's play some music, and when it gets good enough, we'll we'll perform it. You know, that's a vibe, and that's so, different. Sure, sure. It is. I agree with you. In in essence, it's amateur hour. And as you were saying that, I was just kind of reflecting about how, you know, this is that this is that wide ranging thing about what's a pro, right? Um, if a band is run as a a social construct that happens to enjoy playing music and, you know, is good enough. Good enough is the enemy of great, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if your band is, is bowling night replaced, right? Like if that's the point of the band, then I, I suppose that mentality is totally fine, but that's more of a jam session than a, you know, than a, a, a band that's functioning and moving forward. I, I, I think again, and there's nothing wrong with either, but just be honest with what the goal is. And if everybody's on the same page with the goal, then, okay, great. You know, that's, that's fine. You know, is our, right. does our band have to be perfect? Do we want to strive for excellence? Like answering those questions together should then sort of take care of the rest of this. I, yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Uh, it's, but yeah, I, I totally know what you're saying. I don't, I don't mean to sit here and, and sound like a, you know, I'm, I'm sitting atop some, some tower that, that is immune to this. It, I'm not, I've, I've been in that scenario. I've probably been the cause of that. I know I've not probably, I've been the cause of that scenario. I've participated in it, but I, you know, I'm, I'd like to, I'd like to be past that. And, and I haven't yeah, really I had to deal with that for a long time. So, but that, that's, that's going to be your bar about joining a group. And, you know, and I think if more people were like that, you know, we'd get better music. It, it, this is such an interesting thing. Cause this is all about the, this links directly to the guys who take free gigs. I mean, it, it's all yeah, about it's all the, the same thing. That's right. It's all about the tolerance for, um, you know, it, it, which links to the cargo shorts with links to the iPad. <laughs> you know, it's all about, <laughs> it's all, it's all about like, what is absolute professional, right? Well, you know, it's always be performing, right? I mean, we say it every episode, but it like right. that does encompass all of this is, you know, we talked about it. Like the cargo shorts are a great example. Jimmy Buffett plays in cargo shorts, huge career works great for him, but he knows exactly what he's doing. It doesn't mean he's not performing. It doesn't mean he's trying to hide and blend in quite the contrary. He is aspirationally showing you a lifestyle that you're going to love for three hours or whatever. And, and that's, you know, whenever I see those arguments or the p pictures posted, a guy's yeah. in cargo, to go, I'm like, cool. Y you write a song that sells that much. That means that much to people. And then you've earned the right to do what you do. But you know, you and your, you and your cover band in a bar on a Friday night, don't, don't draw 
a, you know, a parallel right. to, you know, a, you know, a, a culturally changing artist, right? Yeah, yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. But, it, but like, there's nothing wrong with a cover band showing up in cargo shorts as long as, like, again, I've said this countless times and I'll say it again, as long as that is intentionally their costume. Like, they, they, th this idea of going up on stage and being blending in with the crowd makes zero sense to me. Like you're going to be on stage. People are going to be looking at you know that own that come to grips with that. And, and I know that for some people and, and at times for me, it, it's a very difficult thing. I mean, it, you know, there's the whole realm of things that fall under the umbrella of stage fright, right. You know, performance anxiety. And, yeah. and, and that I, I think plays no small part in, some folks making the decision to go on stage and, you know, lawn mowing clothes, t-shirt and cargo shirts. Like, well, if I, uh -huh. if I, if I show up like this, nobody's going to look at me. Right. Like, I mean, I think there's part of that. I don't want to put that out there as the only reason, but I think that's a huge part of it. It's like, I am uncomfortable wearing something that acknowledges that people are going to be looking at me. Right. And, and, and that's a thing. And I, I don't mean to shame anybody for that, but I, I, at the very least, be aware of that. Like, yeah, I have performance anxiety. And so cargo shorts are my way of dealing with that. Okay. Like, great. Like, not great, but great. Like, now work through that. Uh, but, yeah. Live music is a visual art. Live music is a visual art. Absolutely. Absolutely. What did Stu say when we were at the first rehearsal, Maybe and maybe also at the last rehearsal, uh, as we were heading into this, he said, um, if something happens... Because something's going to happen, unexpected. We're going to have a, a, a you know, some, there's going to be a mistake made. If there's a problem, if you feel lost, look up instead of looking down. And by looking down, he meant looking at your music, looking up, mm -hmm. looking at your fellow musicians, you know, find the way together. Don't just lose yourself in the, you know, in the charts. And I, I like that a lot. And that I think that speaks to all of this, right? It's like, make sure you are connecting with the other humans in the room, the ones on stage and the ones beyond the stage. It's all, yeah. it's all one thing. So yeah, I, yeah, I, um, but, you know, but there's, I don't know. There's a lot to it, but um, yeah, that's all I have to say. I don't know. I don't know. It's a good conversation. I mean, all, all this stuff is, I, I can't imagine there's anybody, anybody out there listening who, you know, doesn't think about their band's rehearsal work ethic, doesn't think about, you know, wh what is professional for us. I mean, whether you call whether you call it that, you know, you're you're kind of thinking about that. If you book a band, you know, you want you want the book band to be as easy to book as possible, not as hard to book as possible. Right. So you know, you're you're thinking about these things. Right. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, it's just kind of the way it, the way it be. Yeah. I. It's inter this is interesting stuff to talk about. It's yeah. It's good. I and I. It's. I'm glad you brought up the, you know, what is the point of rehearsal thing? Because that's one of those deals where I, like, I, I really try not to be involved in projects anymore that have, you know, the lowest common denominator at rehearsal. I, you know, but again, I, I find myself there occasionally if I've run out of time or whatever, it's like, okay, I know I'm not okay, going to be just perfect. Devil's advocate here. Yeah. There are a bunch of guys who you thought were good players you really liked them. And it was like, Hey, every Tuesday or every Sunday afternoon, come hang out. We'll play some music. We'll have some food. You know, let's see where it goes. Right. Yeah, sure. Would you, you know, would you, would you do, I'll do it, but you know, I don't like this where we'll see where it goes. Like, that's not a great use of my time. Or would you be like, Oh, these are some cool guys. You know, you know, I it, like hanging out with them. It depends on where, like what my time availability is and what my desires are. Like that is exactly what fling started as. When I, I joined that. it, That's why I bring it up? Yeah, and that was it was intentional that I that I joined that. It was like, no, I I don't need a band. I'm already playing in a band, right? I need local friends to meet because I just moved to this area, mm -hmm. and uh, and so it was like, this is bowling night. Okay, great, like no problem. It was totally low key, low pressure. Then over the years, you know, things evolved and the pressure increased and, uh, you know, obviously it, it, it changed and morphed and evolved and, uh, and it's still evolving. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not against it that, but that's just a jam session. It, and that's really what fling was. It, there was no intention of playing out like none. 
Uh, it was only after I would come in, you know, to rehearsal each week and talk about the gigs I played that after time, and it was probably after a year of that, the guys were like, well, maybe we should play some gigs. I'm like, sure. See, that's what's so interesting to me is that once something starts as kind of a casual jam session hang, who's the guy who says, all right, you know, clearly this is a band. Everybody prepare for a starting yeah, next well, week. And Fling, that was Russ. I mean, it was, it, and it was a very... Clear. It wasn't, it was a very, he delivered it very well, but it was a, a very clear, okay, let's shift this. If we're going to do this, let's now watch me raise the bar. Okay. This is where I've set the bar. Let's see how we do with that. Yeah. 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 But, it, but I think that conversation needs to happen. I, I, that's the, the, again, there's nothing wrong with the, you know, Sunday afternoon jam session or the weekly Sunday afternoon jam session, right? Like, that's great. That can be a whole lot of fun. Playing music is actually fun, right? Like, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with just right. hanging out and playing music with people. That's amazing. And and it doesn't need to be perfect. You're just connecting on this, you know, on this different level. And that's outstanding. And as long as everybody knows that that's the expectation, then that's great. But it, you know, the exp the bar needs to be explicitly set sometimes. Sometimes it's, you know, it's understood. But if it's not, there's nothing wrong with explicitly setting it. Like, okay, we're doing this rehearsal. We've only got two rehearsals before the gig. Let's make sure that at this rehearsal, what we're working on is not let's make sure at this rehearsal, everybody comes prepared. Well, at this rehearsal, here's what we're going to work on. So now you know what to prepare, right? Like you show up and do that. As long as you can do that, then, then you're good. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But where it's, it's, I think, I think maybe what you're refer, at least how I'm hearing what you're referring to is, is more the, the, the scenario where it's not really explicitly stated, like what the expectation is. And so it becomes, like you said, over time, it evolves into this thing of like, what's the minimum amount of work I need to do to, to pass muster with the, you know, with the rest of the band, but it's, it becomes this slippery slope or it can become this slippery slope. And that, well, that's it's like a social construct, right? Yeah, like in exactly. any group of people, yeah. there's going to be the, the high achievers. There's going to be the people who are in you know, who are, um, intimidated by, yeah. you know, the high achievers. And so they're going to lay back. There's going to be people who, who just naturally know how far their talents can take them and what they can get away with with the littlest amount of effort. There's going to be people who, you know, know I'm not as talented as the other guys. So I got to work three times as hard to, you know, pull my way. That's just any group you get together, you're going to get all those kind of dynamics. And I totally. think what a good leader does or at least, or a good band of it's a democratic construct is they create a way for everybody to be successful in that, right? So it's, it, you know, you don't ease into bad habits. You encourage good behavior, you know, good habits. Um, you know, you, you you find ways to make, like any organization. I mean, you run a business, Dave, right? You, you know, you, you want what you want to do is create a thing where the machine chugs out positive results. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You, you want the machine to chug out positive results. I like that. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Right. I like it. All right. That's what I have today. You got anything else, man? A whole show about always be performing. I don't even have to say it at the end now. I know. It's it's what we've been doing. Send us your thoughts, folks. Folks, feedback at giggabpodcast.com, just like Eric did. And you know, here's here's where we wind up with that. So. I think maybe we should say it again anyway. Always be performing. Thank you.